I bring greetings to all our viewers and our brothers and sisters and friends who are sharing in this worship service with us this morning. We thank God for today. And uh, th we, are, we are going through a series of lessons that were patterned after our, our vacation Bible school because this is the junior church month. Uh, because of our COVID control situations, we unfortunately could not do our vacation Bible school, but we are glad we can still share the word of God. And last Sunday, uh, one of our teachers in the junior church ministries, Mike, shared with us the first lesson, which is Jesus' power gives us hope. And our big theme is that God's power pulls us through difficult situations and through uh, hard times. And we saw that, we saw how God used a difficult situation, the storm that Paul and the crew that was with him were going through. And through that, Paul was able to witness to all the people that were with him. And they saw God's power. And today, we want to still look at how God's power gives us boldness to do other hard things. And the hard thing we are talking about today is strange. Like when we say, it's, uh, we're saying that God's power gives us boldness to share the gospel of Christ. And I kept thinking, sharing the gospel of Christ is not like going through a storm. Why should that be a hard thing? I even wondered more when I went through some online dictionaries and I looked at what does the word gospel mean? Because we talk about the gospel of Luke, but uh, some of the good descriptions that I liked were that there was one that said the gospel is the unquestionable truth or an idea that's accepted as undoubtedly true and or teachings of great importance. Then I, as I looked more, I saw that the root word gospel comes from the Anglo-Saxon languages and it's derived from a term that's written, God's spell, God's spell. I'm not pronouncing it like an Anglo-Saxonist because I, not. But uh, in English, it means good story. And I really liked that definition. So in our conversations this morning, I will tend to use the term good story more than the gospel, just for our own understanding of what we are talking about. Uh, good stories have good news in them. And when we are told a good story, sometimes it brings us joy, it makes us laugh. Good stories give us hope. And, some, and many, many good stories have a happy ending. And today is a time we can long for a good story because the times we are living in don't seem to have very many good stories. In fact, this weekend, uh, yesterday, I was looking at the newspaper and I realized we are so blessed around this season in our newspapers to have some good stories because KCP results are out and of course the headlines are covered with all those children who performed very well and those are very good news. But I want to challenge you and to encourage you on a typical season to check the newspaper on a, just a normal time. No results, nothing. Check out the headlines and you can count and find out how many have good stories and how many have stories that are not so good. Actually, sad stories. Same thing with TV news clips. It would be a good research for us to do and find out whether we actually have more bad stories than good stories. Uh, some of the bad stories we have, of course, like now we are 
going through this suffering under an invisible enemy called COVID-19, who has uh, really derailed some of our activities. And because of the consequences of that, we have sad stories of death, sickness, economies that are going down, crushing businesses. We have tensions. We, have, we hear of crimes that are related. So this is a very difficult time. It's a time full of bad stories. And that's why this morning it would be nice to talk about to, how we should have boldness even to share the good story or a good story. And that's why we are saying it still will take boldness. Because you can imagine if you walk into a family that has been bereaved, they are burying their loved one who has died of COVID-19, and some others are in hospital struggling for their lives, and you want to go and tell them it is going to be well, it is all well. Will you have courage to say that? I think I wouldn't have courage. The best maybe I might do is just go and sit down and quietly listen and be with We are not even allowed many to, to be mourning, so it makes it even a worse story. So it is good, it, we, it takes courage to be able to take a good story in an environment full of bad stories. And this story, the good story, the best story ever told was the story of Jesus Christ about his sacrificial love that brought joy and life to all creation, that redeemed us from death and joined us with God and made us heirs, co-heirs with him of the heavenly places. And it takes boldness to share that story in a world that is full of bad stories, in a world where we even have the spirit that rejects Christ. It takes boldness. Um, the summary of this story is in the book of John chapter 3, verse 16, which many of us have known ever since we were children, because whether we were Christians or not, we have, we, we have learned that in Bible, in school. And you can try to say it with me from where you are seated at home. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a wonderful story, isn't it? It, it redeems us from perishing, that we may have everlasting life. And as I thought, why it takes us, why, why we need boldness to share this such sweet, good story, why we can't just tell it because it's a good story. I reflected on the scriptures that we read this morning, and we read very long passages from the book of Acts, chapter 3, and also a part of chapter 4, um, talking about some events that happened in the Bible. And I want us to go to, con to, to kind of look at those, that story, that account, and as we discuss it, we will find that there may be two things, two obstacles that stand on our way, two obstacles that even put fear in us that we are not able to tell this good story. And one of that is the fear of inconvenience. You know, sharing God's love demands that we pause our business and focus on the needs of others. And that is not always easy. Because it will mean going out of our way, taking a detour from our priorities, and focusing on the priorities that God is giving us. As we shall see, that is what Peter and John did when they were going to the temple. The second obstacle I saw is the fear of alienation and hostility from those we want to belong to. Because sometimes sharing the good news, even in our times, can expose us to criticism. It will expose us to ridicule and persecutions, even losses. And worse more, 
it, will expose, it can expose us to death of our physical body. Thank God it is not death of our eternal life. So in our, in our Bible readings, we saw that. And I, I would like us to just follow and look at the events that were happening in Jerusalem. In that afternoon, the hour of prayer, as Peter and John, Peter and John went to pray. And we see Peter and John walking, and many other people were walking in Jerusalem. I think when we look at the Bible from the book of Nehemiah, it's like Jerusalem had a, 10 gates, and they all have different names. And I think that can be a conversation for another day. But it seems like many people were moving with Peter and John, and they were going through one particular gate that was called the Beautiful Gate. And there, at the Beautiful Gate, sat this lame man who was brought there and kept there so that he can receive help from all those who are coming in. And that was quite strategic because if people are passing there and they are coming for the hour of prayer, these are faithful people, he expects they will think about him. They will give something. And giving alms was seen as a way of also increasing one's piety, one's righteousness, one's acceptability to God. So when he saw Peter and John coming, I imagine, the Bible doesn't say it, but I imagine in, by the power of the Holy Spirit, they, they were also drawn that there was a ministry they were going to do there. And if you have watched beggars on the street, they don't beg the person who is just walking, looking ahead. If you turn and look at them, they, they then now know that's a, that's a person I can talk to. So I imagine Peter and John may have first of all gazed at him, and then he looked at them and said, help. And then when he called to them, they looked at him straight. And they said, look at us. And the man became excited. Oh, here is somebody interested in me. And I don't know whether you've ever seen somebody begging and on the streets. Those people who sit there, we see them everywhere. When you show interest in them, they really get excited. And this beggar became very excited and looked at them. But then... Peter started with the bad news. This man was expecting money. But Peter told him, look at us. We don't have silver and we don't have gold. And I can imagine, you know how the brain works. Suddenly the brain must have been like switching off, like, so why were you asking me to look at you? But before he went into turning to look at somebody else who might give him money, Peter quickly added the good news. He said, no, but we have something. And what we have is what we are going to give to you. And so he, they told him, Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. And Peter took a bold step and held his hand. You know, this is a lame man. You might pull him and the body remains there and it will be very, very embarrassing. Why are you saying he's, he's getting well? But Peter had the bold faith to hold his hand, pick him up, and he stood up. And he, like we read in the scriptures, his joints got strength. And he started walking, jumping, leaping, and praising God as he walked with Peter and John into the temple. And you know, so many people had passed through that gate. So many times this beggar had stayed there and the fact that he came day after day after day, we are told he was now 40 or over 40 years, he had begged there. He had, he had asked for arms or for help for a long time and many people had given him but nobody had ever connected this man with a real source of true wealth of true life, of strength, except when Peter and John came. And they did not tell him. They said, us, we have nothing, but we will take you. We connect you to the one who has, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He provided healing, and the man was excited. You know, people talk about networks these days. 
It's like your networks will determine what you get. So only Peter and John were well networked to network this lame man to a source that doesn't run dry, or a source that will supply him for eternity. And that is the source of Jesus Christ. As the people watched, they were intrigued by what was happening. And they came to Peter and John to come and see this great miracle that has happened. So again, Peter and John got an opportunity to network Jesus Christ with more and more people to broaden the networks so that they can draw more people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they pointed the people to Christ, reminding him, reminding them, this man is well because of Jesus Christ, whom you rejected and crucified. And you know, Peter was not just talking to crowds on the street. He was talking to pious Jews, Jews who were very keen on observing their religious worship. And these are the Jews who had rejected Jesus because of saying he was the son of God. So they were taking a risk, telling them this miracle is happening because of Jesus. They were taking a risk by, re by judging these Jew Jews and telling them, you know, you rejected that Jesus. You know, you killed him. They were taking a big risk. But they went on anyway and told the story. And they told them, this Jesus, whom you rejected, is the one who has made this man well. And the crowds believed. Many of them believed. Why? Because they saw the good story, they heard the good story, and they saw the work of Jesus there and then as the lame man was healed. The other risk that Peter and John were taking is that these things, they were speaking in the open, they were speaking them publicly, and the temple leaders, the high priests, and the dignitaries of the church, or of the temple, were around. And these were the Sanhedrin, who had instigated the masses against Jesus, who had handed Jesus over to the Roman rulers so that he can be judged. So you would imagine, I would imagine if I was Peter and John saying, well, I'm going to talk to the people, but I don't want the Sanhedrin to hear because whatever they did to Christ, they could also do to them. So again, it, requires, it required boldness for Peter and John to publicly speak out Imagine this was a large crowd, so they were not just talking softly. They were addressing a big theme and saying that the power of the risen Christ is at work. And that power of the risen Christ was at work in Peter and John. They were empowered. That's why they were not afraid. And that's why we are saying, telling this good story, will require boldness, and that boldness will be drawn from Jesus, who gives us power. And Jesus had promised power. I would like us to read from the book of Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 to see how Jesus promised them power and how this power was now at work. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will tell people about me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and you will even tell other people about me from one end of the earth to the other. You see, Jesus knew that they needed boldness, and that's why he promised them the power of the Holy Spirit, especially in speaking, telling this good story in Jerusalem, which was a center of opposition for Jesus. And because of the bold proclamation of the word, Many people believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many Jews believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church grew in numbers in thousands. That was a powerful altar call. And of course, like we said, 
Peter and John, uh, the, the Sanhedrin, noted what was happening. They saw these many Jews that were beginning to believe in Jesus, who, in, according to them, was their arch enemy. And they were not happy. They were up in arms. So they seized Peter and John, and they threw them in jail. I would imagine they were hoping mm, by the following day, the crowd will have scattered, the lame man will have gone, so they can intimidate Peter and John in the absence of the large crowds. So the following day, they brought them to, a, to the council, the Sanhedrin, which consisted of high priests, temple leaders, and dignitaries of the Jews sitting around them. I would call it like the supreme jury of Jerusalem. So Peter and John were brought before the supreme jury of Jerusalem, the high court of the temple. And they wanted to, this supreme jury was well connected even with the Roman government. It is their connect, they had used their connections to accuse Jesus falsely and even to lie about his resurrection. So Peter and John could have suffered even more being mere men. And it required boldness for them to stand before this jury. Let's see what happened. This jury started asking them, interrogating them, and asking them, by what power or what name did you do this? In other words, they are saying, we are the authority here in Jerusalem. Who gave you power? Who gave you authority to come and do these things here? And do you know, they had raised the same questions. They had brought the same challenge to the Lord Jesus Christ where, during his ministry on earth. I want us to look at Luke chapter 20 and verse 1 to 2 and see what they had said to Jesus. Luke chapter 20 and verse 1 and 2. It says, One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courts and preaching the gospel, the good story, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came to him. Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? They said, who gave you this authority? The same, same question. They, want to, they felt like they were the authority in Jerusalem. They were the authority of the Jews. So what authority is Jesus using? And you know, Peter and John were not intimidated, just like the Lord Jesus wasn't. And that power he had drawn from God to preach and to teach the good news, he had passed it on to his disciples. And no wonder they were bold and full of the Holy Spirit, Peter declared, it is by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, God raised, that God has raised, sorry, Peter said, it is by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man is standing before you healed. And as if to judge them even more and rebuke them for their wrongs, Peter added, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. And Peter went on to esteem Jesus, to honor him in the presence of his enemies. And he told them, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved, except the name of Jesus. So Peter and John received boldness from God to elevate and to honor Jesus in the presence of his enemies. And while we would expect the enemies to be angry and start assaulting Peter and John, the power of God that protects us and was present also to protect them. Mtetezi wao akanza kuwatetea. And so the jury was frozen. They were actually astonished at the courage 
of these unschooled ordinary men who are able to stand before them and talk without fear. From the text, we see they had witnessed three unrefutable testimonies of Jesus' power and authority. The first testimony was that two influential men from the school of Jesus was sta were standing before them. And the jury itself discussed among themselves and they said, these people must have drawn their courage from Jesus. So how could they deny that Jesus has the power to do the impossible? The second testimony was the lame man who was lame from birth, who was sitting at the temple gate for so many years because the Bible tells us he was like 40 years. So everybody in Jerusalem knew him. Nobody could refute and say this is another one. Uh -uh. That was another witness. And the third one was that many, many Jews in Jerusalem, pious Jews, had seen the miracle, had heard the good story from Peter and John about Jesus Christ, and they had put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They had converted and said, this Jesus is worthy following. So this jury was at a loss. What were they going to do? They asked each other. And they said, you know, all we can do is to warn these people strongly and tell them we don't want to hear you speaking in this name. So they told Peter and John, we don't want to hear you speak in this name. But you know, their threats were late. They had overestimated their authority. Unfortunately, or praise be to God, a supreme authority was already at work in Peter and John. They had received Jesus' power through the Holy Spirit, and they had become unstoppable in sharing the love of Jesus. God had opened doors before them that Jews were coming to them to be told about the good story. And the persuasive power of God was at work among the Jerusalem community with one altar call over 2,000 people had come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? Under persecution, during a time of intimidation, the Church of Christ was growing rapidly. So these, these uh, Jewish leaders were really feeling at a loss. But to just keep their face up, they just repeated themselves and still cautioned Peter and John and just said, okay, we just don't want to hear you around here speaking about this name of Jesus. But Peter and John, like I said, were unstoppable and without fear. We read in Acts chapter 4 and verse 19 and 20, I would like us to read and just see how they answered. Acts chapter 4 and verse 19 to 20. Peter and John answered them and said, which is right from God's point of view? Should we listen to you or should we listen to God? You be the judges. There is nothing we can do. We have to speak about the things we have seen and heard. Peter and John just said we have to continue telling this good story because that's what we know. And you know, other New Testament accounts show that Jesus' power was also at work in other brethren during the early church, and they boldly declared the good story of Jesus, and many people came to the Lord, but they also suffered for the good story. People like Paul, people like Stephen, Peter as he continued and many of his disciple colleagues suffered for this good story, but they boldly continued to declare it, even at the point of death for some of them, because Jesus' power gave them boldness to declare the story of Jesus, the story of hope, the story 
of salvation for all mankind. So what can we learn from these brothers that can inspire us to also look to God, to God for power, for boldness, so we can carry on this good story in a world where the story of Jesus is no longer very popular. Uh, one time I was in a group uh, doing some academic work and we were challenged to work within a minute to come up with an action song. And because I'm a Sunday school teacher, most of the songs that run in my head are action songs singing with kids in church. And so when we went, the group was like, now what do we do? And the clock was ticking. So I told them, I'll teach you a song. And so we did a Sunday school song with actions. A song that says, be kind to one another and build each other up. There was no, we didn't even mention Jesus. And our group was the first one to present. We were ready before all the other groups. But you know, one of our assessors says, said, who is the Sunday school teacher among you? Because it's, you know, this gospel is not popular. And people are shy to speak about Jesus because of what's happening today. Because people want to say, don't teach that as if it's the only gospel. There are many others. But we know it is the only one that hasn't changed, will never change, and the only one that carries true hope. So what can we learn? We learn that the power of Jesus makes us bold to believe and receive deliverance of sin first for ourselves and also others, to lead others to receive it. Peter and John believed that Christ could heal and so they stopped and they stooped to share the good news with the lame man. And in the absence of Jesus' power, they could have settled to just mere religion of tossing a coin to earn more righteousness and move on and just dismiss the man as an inconvenience. After all, they were working in the church to do very serious business of prayer. But they stopped. Um, as we think about that, I would like us to think of the image of a beggar. Like I said, we have very many of these people. We meet them on the streets. We meet them outside supermarkets and stores because they normally sit at strategic places. And as I thought about this beggar, I asked myself, what if when churches are open, right now we are on lockdown, but what if as we walked to church, we found that some people had come and placed a beggar outside our church gate strategically so that we can give as we walk in on a Sunday morning. What would be our response? What would be your response? If you found a lame person and they're just telling you, Saidiya, wanakupea mkono. What would be your response? Maybe we need to think about that. Do we have boldness to do something beyond just tossing a coin? But, but, Peter and John did not see that man as a disruption. They responded to him and gave what they had. It's a challenge to us. What do we give to those beggars? Are we willing to sacrifice our comfort and take time and share with them the good news of Christ? However, I don't want to go so much into the physical lameness. I want us to focus on some lameness that's not physical. And God is calling us to look at lameness. People are disabled in many ways. Some people are paralyzed socially. They have no friends, they are lonely. Others are paralyzed economically. They don't have basic needs and others are paralyzed intellectually. And they are not able to hope and live and praise God because of these lameness. Some may have material wealth, everything they need, but they don't have the good story. They don't have Christ. And so they are also lame in their own way. So God is calling us to keep our spiritual eyes open 
and see all the lame people around us and the different lameness they have and trust God to empower us to be able to reach out to these people like Peter and John and give them what we have. But because this month is children's month, it's junior church ministry in our church, uh, allow me to focus on some lame people that I see around us related to children's, to children's church. People that we need to stoop to see, stoop and stop so we can help them. And these are unattended children. Unattended children are lame in many ways. When children are not attended, they are insecure, they are confused, they are vulnerable, some of them suffer hunger, and many of them are without a vision. And you know, even in our congregation, we have such children who come to church unattended. They come alone without a responsible adult. And for the majority of them, even as Sunday school teachers, we have not met their parents. Because when they come, we ask them, you know, you ask them, they don't know the number of their parents, and so we can't communicate with the parents. The best way we could communicate would be follow them as they leave Sunday school and go to know where do they come from. And these children are lame. Some of them are lame in many ways. We have one of the Kiswahili services, which is not meeting, of course, right now. But in that Kiswahili service, most of those children come without parents. And many of them come from far, walking. And I love them because they are like the disciples of Jesus. They call their friends and tell them, let's go to church. And although many of them have gone to school, our experiences is that some of them suffer from severe literacy challenges that derail them to have, from having academic progress. And they struggle with socioeconomic challenges that confine them to the same unpleasant standards that they have been born. So it's like they are lame, sitting there like the lame man, not being able to move on. And those are the children, even today as we are broadcasting this message, or even we also broadcasted our Sunday school lesson this morning, those are the children who cannot access these lessons because maybe the parent doesn't have a smartphone, or if the smartphone is there, there is no data. And I ask myself, as we listen to this message, as we sit and feel good, do we know what's happening to those children now as when we are on lockdown? They may be lacking in ballast diets that would help them in their brain development as they are, uh, they are growing. And this is also a time when kids need good feeding because of fighting the virus that is fighting all of us. And we have observed some of these children have a very distorted view of the world that needs to be illuminated and enlarged through the love of Christ that flows through you and I. I remember talking to one of them and asking them, what would you like to do when you grow up? And this little child told me, uh, I would like to be a university student. And I was like curious. Then I asked him, oh, why? What would you like to study in the university? He said, no, I would like to be a university student so I can fight with the police on the streets because I see them throwing stones to the police and I hate the police. So you can see. And these children are around, when we, you walk out of the church compound, you'll see some of them. You walk out of your house in your street, you'll see some of them. You walk in the city, we see them. They are invisible and invisible corners of our communities. Do we see them? Have you seen them? You know, Peter and John, in order to minister to this lame man, they were up walking. The lame man was seated. 
So they had to stop and stoop so they can get to his level. Because I imagine them telling him, look at us. You know, when you look at somebody, you lock eyes. You must be at the same level. Have we stooped to lock eyes with these little children? Or we just let them pass? Do we know where they live? When they come to church and when they go home, are they really experiencing the gospel of love, the good story, through the church family? Because when they come here, they say they are going to church. This is where they belong. And it's just, I wouldn't like to name names. My heart sometimes bleeds because I know some who have come on and on and have felt they have no church family and they have gone. And the world is always waiting for them to receive them. They don't take them to the temple like Peter and John took the lame man when he walked. They take them elsewhere. And then we begin to complain. We begin to be afraid of them. But we never gave them the good story. They never experienced the good story from us. There are also others who are neglected right inside our houses. They have everything. We have given them the, uh, the, 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 what they need, the material things they need, just like Peter and John, uh, just like the people in, in going to the temple, gave everything, gave arms, helped this lame man, and they must have given generously. That's why he came day after day. But they never gave him life. They never com connected him to a source that he can draw for himself. We have children in our own houses. We bring them to church, and then we send them to Sunday school. But I want to tell us that that one lesson on a Sunday morning is not enough to write the good story in the hearts of our children. We need to do more when we are at home. Are we stooping down to the level of our children at home? Are we sitting down with them? at a level we can lock eye to eye and tell them the good story? Or are we just giving them what we, they need and we walk off? You know, this time of pandemic has really taught us hard lessons that the formal institutions that we have depended upon year after year to teach our children can close up. And one of the questions I've been asking myself is, if this pandemic went even for another year, what kind of children will come out of it? Are they going to be children who's, who have the good story in their hearts? Or are they going to be children in whose hearts has been written a lot of trash by watching media? What are we doing about those children in our houses? We have a responsibility to teach them the good story, day after day after day. Write that story in their hearts so that when they come out of COVID, when they go back to school, when they will be able to attract other people to Christ. This lame man went jumping and praising God, and because of that, more and more people came to Christ. We also need boldness to do that because as parents, we are working hard, aren't we, to provide for all the needs of our children. I need boldness to be that parent who doesn't have the latest car because I have taken time to be more with my children and I haven't worked for the millions other people are working for. I need to, be, to, to have boldness to be that mother who will be called just a housewife, not a professional, because I have taken time to write the good story of Jesus by interacting with my children rather than you know, being out there, working hard and earning uh, accolades of professionalism. And I'm not saying professionalism is bad, but at what cost are we gaining some of these accolades? At the cost of leaving our children lame and not having the good story forever. And you know, as they grow, like I said, the world is writing stories in their hearts. What will they become? Will they continue to be spiritual lame, spiritually lame, or are they going to jump 
and praise the Lord. And how I pray, the Lord will help us to stop, see, and stoop, and pass on the good story to our children in, our, in the way we treat them, in the way we take time to teach them, because the time is short. Secondly, the power of God, and this is our, the, the second point for, for, as we finish, the power of God makes us bold to esteem Jesus before his enemies. We see Peter and John, like I said, publicly declared in the name of Jesus. They were not afraid to mention the name of Jesus. God has glorified his servant Jesus. They were repeatedly elevating Jesus. They called him the author of life and the creator, making him equal to God before these Jews who said by Jesus saying he's a son of God, that is serious blasphemy. It requires death. They repeated the same. They said Jesus is the author of life, meaning he's equal to God. And they declared by faith in the name of Jesus, the faith that comes through him, this man is well. They told the crowds, the God of our fathers has glorified Jesus. You killed him, the author of life, but God has raised him from the dead. And they challenged them. And because of the bold challenge, many people came to Jesus. But Peter and John were very, very careful to put themselves out of the the, the, out of the scene, or, or rather to put themselves out of the glory and say it is Jesus. Don't look at us like it is us who have done this. And I ask myself, when God works spectacular works through the church, it's a great opportunity for us to give him glory. But for him to work spectacular works, we also need to step out and allow him to use us. We have to open ourselves and to believe also in the, in, the, in the good story of Jesus. And then we can seize the opportunity to acknowledge that we can't do it without Jesus. We are celebrating KCPE. Those children have passed by the help of God. And of course, we know teachers have worked hard. The children have worked hard. But without God, that cannot be. What are your successes? Do you use your successes to say it is God? God has helped me. We have opportunities as God gives us successes to proclaim it is God working in me. It's not me because it's true. But sometimes we are also intimidated by those who are around us and those who are present so that we begin to ascribe power and glory to earthly powers. When God protected us last year from COVID-19, I think we were not having as many deaths and infections as we are. Did we really glorify God? Or did many of us spend time lashing and thinking we are holier than those who are dying? I saw a lot of that in social media. I hope the church, we the church were not part of that. Sometimes we can start thinking that it's because we are better, but we need to glorify God. And today now we are concerned. Things are very bad right now. The disease is spreading all over. It used to be confined to the big cities. Now it's in the rural areas too. We are praying and fasting also because we are also concerned about the political climate in our country. We are concerned about the state of the economy. But you know, we are also intimidated by our tribal alliances. Just like some of the Jews who are intimidated by the fact that we are, you know, you know, we are this class. I imagine that jury, the Sanhedrin, you know, we have to speak in one voice because we are in this class. We are the leaders in the temple. So we find ourselves intimidated by our tribal alliances that we are praying for a good government. But then we are, again, responding to the voices of our tribes, of the people that we think are our people. And that makes us not be able to tell the good story. 
we are tied to pursuits of position and power, and they muzzle us. They cause us not to be able to talk because we have received favors from the very people that we could challenge. If Peter and John had received favors from the Sanhedrin, they would not challenge them. But when we receive our favors from heaven, we, can, we, we are not afraid to challenge wickedness. I ask myself, with the kind of church we have in our country, why do we continue to do things the way we do them? Why do we continue to have tribalism, even in the church? Because our alliances are not with the author of the good story, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And we remain silent when names, other names are being exalted above the name of Jesus. I have personally been bothered. And if this touches you, please forgive me, but I can't help but speak about it. I have personally been bothered by the way we do our national days of prayer. We go and gather together and put an altar of worship for our true God together with idols. And we call upon this idol and we call upon this idol and we also stand up and call upon God. And God is very clear in his word. We can't worship God and bear all on the same altar. And I just want to challenge us and challenge especially those of you whom God has graciously placed in positions of authority and to interact with the people of authority to ask God to give you boldness so that you can say like Daniel, I'm sorry, I can't do this. I pray that God will make us bold to share the good story of Jesus by the way we conduct ourselves in the marketplace, in our offices, as we interact with people everywhere. May God give us power to say no to the wicked alliances in high places, which seek salvation from other names apart from the name of Jesus. May God give us boldness to say no to those favors that we are given because they buy and delete the good story from our heart and make us cowards who cannot speak the good story to the wicked forces of this world. May God give us power and courage to tell every authority that there is no other name by which a nation like Kenya can be restored but the name of Jesus. So that when we gather to pray for this nation, whether we gather in our parks or in, high, in hotels, we gather to pray in the name of Jesus. For salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. It's not the name of the chief political party. It's not the power of dignitaries here on earth, only the name of Jesus. May God give us power, especially us who are, take leadership in the church and in, you know, take, have a, a say in these national gatherings and forums that we will be bold like Peter and John and declare the name of Jesus. And so as we finish, I want to summarize that we can only give what we have. Peter and John declared Adarani. They said it. We don't have silver and gold, but we will give you what we have. We have Jesus in us. His power is at work in us. It will work in you. Is Jesus' power at work in you? You know, you can't give what you don't have. I can't give what I don't have. So I want to challenge us. First of all, we must be sure Jesus' power is at work in us because we have believed in him. We have surrendered to his lordship. We are saying he must reign. He must increase while I decrease. And when we have done that, then we can be able to pass on what we have to those who are lame in different ways and give them the power of God that will cause them to rise up. The second thing is that I want to, to encourage us to pray. Pray for yourself that God will open your eyes today and every day to see only one lame child 
only one lame child. The child could be in your house, the child could be in your neighborhood, in the church, and that you will stoop down and lock your eyes with that child and begin to know one another, begin to develop a relationship with that child, begin to know what is their relationship with God, begin to allow them also to intrude your life, visit them, especially those ones whose, whose parents we don't know, visit them, allow them to visit your house, it will take boldness, because sometimes they will walk through the swamps and come in your clean house with uh, muddy shoes. But it takes boldness to do some of these things that look weird to the world. But that is telling the good story. That is writing the good story in their hearts. And as they are growing to be youth, also follow them up. Know what are they up to? And I want to challenge our brothers. And again, forgive me. But I look and I see children, the, the, the children are more mentored by women. They are brought up by mother at home. They go to school in, in the ECDs. The majority of the teachers are women. They come to Sunday school. I thank God for our church. We have some men who are really devoted in teaching the word. But children are surrounded by women. If you count the people that are affecting the life of a child, even boys, most of them are women. And I want to challenge you, uh, my brothers, that boys, women cannot teach boys how to be men. Only men can teach children, boys how to be men. So pray that God gives you boldness to put aside your priorities so that you can pick up one little boy and walk with him until he is a man. And there will be a ripple effect. Just that one lame man brought a ripple effect and drew thousands to Jesus. You dare God and see what will happen. And finally, let's pray for boldness to share the, goodness, the good news in the marketplace. And we ourselves to be a story. If, I, if you walked in my office, maybe where I work, and you heard people talking about me, what would, what would they be saying? If I walked in your office, wherever, if somebody could hear your story, does your life tell the good story of Jesus? Do people say, Huyo, he's incorruptible, you can't corrupt them. What they have said, they will do the right thing, no matter what. Let us be, show the good story by our conduct, but let us also tell the good story. And so may God bless you, may God bless us. May he make us bold, because Jesus is coming soon. We need to tell this story with urgency. And that's my prayer for all of us as we go.